Do you would uh, join with me in prayer. We thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you, Father, for the kidders. We bless them, Father. I ask for God that you would strengthen them and encourage them. I thank you for the opportunity that we had to speak with them today. Father, I ask that you would just have your will in your way with us today. Strengthen your people, Father. Encourage us to be everything that you have called us to be. We bless your name. We ask your blessing on the reading of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Colossians chapter 1. I don't know that I'm going to get finished today, but there's a number of things that I was contemplating this week, and I want to share them with you. Uh, Colossians chapter 1. I'm starting in verse 24. Paul writes, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. We talked last week, we spent quite a bit of time talking about salvation. And, and the understanding that before salvation we were enemies of God. Uh, not not just floating along in the river of life, but we were actively resistant and in our minds we were hostile. We were enemies to God. And how through the cross, um, Jesus has reconciled us to him. And how, you know, the just punishment for us is death. Eternal death, eternal separation from God. That's just. But, but see, God plays by his own rules. And what was required for the remission of sins was the shedding of blood. And he provided that. He provided that through his son and reconciled us to him. And, and we went through that phrase again, but God. Okay, I love that phrase. Because it always starts with the bad news. And then, but God, and there's good news. And that's the whole point of the gospel. Okay, is you have to understand the bad news before the good news makes any sense. Okay, if you don't understand the, the bad news, the good news isn't good news. It's just trivial information. So I want to run over a couple things real quick here. And, and um, first, you know, one of the, this, this has always been one of those passages that bothers me. Okay? Um, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. That doesn't really bother me. Um, I mean, Scripture is very clear. You know, um, James chapter 1 says, Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because it's building your faith. Okay? It's, it's building you up. Peter tells us the same thing. Why do you act as if something strange has come upon you? Don't you know this is for your benefit? That you may be refined as gold and silver? That you may wear clothes of white raiment? Why are you surprised? Uh, Jesus even says, Rejoice! when they persecute you. Rejoice. Be happy. Have joy in this. So this, this doesn't really bother me. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. That's what we're supposed to do. Remember that whole paradigm, the, the, the knot hole of the cross, how everything is upside down? Well, really, it's not upside down on that side of the cross. It's upside down on this side of the cross. Okay, we look at everything upside down before Jesus. And then when we come to Jesus, He turns things right side up. But to us, that, that's backwards. It takes a while for us to get over the vertigo. To understand this is the way it's supposed to be. Okay? But what bothers me is where he says, And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. Now, the first reading of that would indicate that, that Christ didn't suffer enough. Isn't that kind of, kind of what you see here? What, what, what is lacking in Christ's afflictions? Was anything lacking in Christ's afflictions? Is Paul making a mistake here? No, he's not making a mistake. And there was absolutely nothing lacking in his affliction. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to say, it is finished. It is accomplished. 
Okay? If there was more suffering needed, he would have just lived longer. Okay? So his suffering, his affliction was sufficient. So what does Paul mean when he's talking here? I honestly believe, I think this is, is a poor, it's a problem in languages. Okay? It's a problem going from the Greek understanding of how it's said to the English understanding of how it's said. Now, if, if, I, if you'll allow me, I'm going to share with you what I believe this means. Okay? If it's not, Christ's afflictions are insufficient. Notice the key word that follows this. He says, um, lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Okay, if Paul is referring to this in the manner of the church, wh who are we supposed to be like? Christ, right? Okay, remember that, that Jesus tells us both in Mark and Luke that if you would follow him, you have to what? Okay? Take up your cross. Yeah. Luke even says take up your cross daily and follow him. Okay? What is the earmark of a Christian? Stephen Curtis Chapman has a song. I'm not going to sing it for you. Okay, I got it at home on an MP3 if you want to. You know, I'll, I'll let you borrow it. You can listen. Okay, but it's, the song is, you know, what kind of joy is this? And it talks about what kind of joy can stare death in the face and see it as sweet victory. Okay? What kind of joy looks at prison with hope? Okay? This whole dynamic of being a Christian, and see, this is going to lead me into where I actually want to go today. This is one of the things that has been troubling me. See, we have this idea and this completely convoluted and backwards culture that when you become a Christian, everything's good. And if things get bad, who doesn't? Really? If there is someone out here that does not have sin that you have not revealed to me, put your hand up. You guys don't have any sin? Somebody get me a rock. No. See, the understanding is we still have the sin nature. It's being killed. It's that slow strangulation death. Okay? That's what makes grace so absolutely marvelous. Because it covers all sin once and for all. Everything. Okay. I remember getting into a fairly heated debate with a friend of mine from college. And, and he did not subscribe to eternal security. He believed that you could have salvation and lose it and gain it and lose it and gain it and lose it. And, and, and he uh, asked me one day, he said, so, so then what happens if you commit suicide? What about it? Well, you're dying in your sins. No, I'm not dying in my sins. His blood has covered my sins. I said, what happens if you step out in the street and see a car about to hit you? Because I guarantee you, you're going to say something not nice. <sighs> oh, dang. <laughs> Darn it. You're going to die in your sin. If you really believe that God's grace, His power is so minute that it can't save you from that, then how can you believe that it ever saved you in the first place? Okay? Now, here's the problem. Jesus is talking about the end times. It's both in, in uh, Matthew, I believe it's chapter 24. It's also in Luke. And he says, these are the signs of the end of time. Okay? And we hear about the wars and the rumors of wars and men's hearts failing them from fear and, and all of these things. But there's one phrase that comes in there that really concerns him. And he says, there will be a flood of dissipation. Okay? Now, can anyone tell me what dissipation means? Do you know what dissipation means? Hmm? Dissipation means to squander willfully <coughs> or to engage in frivolously. Okay? Now, why this is problematic is this is one of the key signs that Jesus gives that the end times are upon us. Is that people are not going to take serious the things of God because of the flood of dissipation. They're going to be too interested in their own amusements. This is a deadly, dangerous thing. Because see, what Paul tells us here is that he's bearing in his body the afflictions on behalf of the church. Okay? 
What happens to one member happens to all. What happens to one member happens to all. When one part rejoices, we all rejoice. When one part hurts, we all hurt. And we have people lifting their nose up at being invested in a body, local body. Why don't we church? Bull. God has said in your word, you need church. You need a local body to be integrated in, knitted into. Why? For your sake and for theirs. That's the way he's designed this thing to work. You have to be knitted into a body. Look, we got way too many heinies in the body of Christ. We got way too many people in the body of Christ that are heinies. All they want to do is this. My job is to sit and be comfortable. I'm a hiney. Am I wrong? But see, God hasn't called you to come in and park your butt. God has called you to come in and work. To be integrated, to be knitted in, to do. Okay? You know what happens to a part of the body that doesn't work? What happens to it? It dies. It dies. All right? Sometimes painfully so. You know, years ago, I had to have my appendix out. It died. Okay? Unfortunately, it died a long time before they knew it died. And so it got septic. You want to talk about pain, that thing did not go easily. It hurt. And in the body of Christ, sometimes... If you are not productive, you will die, and a lot of times it will be painfully. Okay. Now, the flood of dissipation, I want to ask you, examine your hearts, examine your lives. What is more important to you? Is it more important to do the things of God that he has called us to do? Right, let's just start with the basics. Is it more important to you to spend time in his word, studying his word, not just doing your little you know, 30-second daily reading, Wow, man, all right, today I did three and a half verses. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being invested in the love letter that God has written you. The life lessons that he is presenting to you. Or is it more important to watch your favorite TV show? Is it more important to spend time on your knees, on your face before the throne of God, interceding on behalf of his people and the unsaved? Or is it more important to participate in your hobby? Is it more important to you to fellowship? Not, I'm not talking about the red punch fellowship. I'm not talking about the sipping coffee fellowship. I'm talking about being integrated fellowship. Okay? Being invested in each other's lives. Fellowship. Is it more important to have fellowship with his body as directed in his word? Or is it more important to do your own thing? Whatever. I mean, you know, my weakness, one of the one of my biggest distractions, my weakness is reading. Okay, um, I, I don't read words. I watch movies in books. I don't know if you can't do it, then it doesn't. I can't really explain it to you. When I start reading, I see about the first three words, and then I'm watching a movie. I don't even see the words. Anymore. Okay, um, but that tends to be a big distraction because I get caught up in the story. And, and I find when I'm in a, a really interesting part of the book, I rush through this so I can get back to my book. Okay. See, the, the, the flood of dissipation is catering to yourself. What amuses you? What titillates? What tickles? And that's not the life he's called us to. Do you see, do you see in his word he's not called us to this? Jesus says, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. Are you a stench? Do you stink? Does the world know you stink? Because if the world doesn't know you stink, then you're not truly being representative of Christ. Because they don't get it. They don't want it. They don't like it. They can't comprehend it. The salvation that we have, this upside down life that we live, they don't get And if you're not a stench, it's probably because you've taken it and you've 
pulled it all together and put a lid on it. Odor-free baggies. Is your Christianity in an odor-free baggie? Or is your Christianity out there for the whole world to see? Now, sometimes we blow it. We blow up big. We mess up. Again, let's go back to, that's the marvelous thing about His grace. God can take even mess-ups and make beautiful things. Make beautiful things happen. Okay? Concentration camp, World War II, Corrie Ken Boone and her sister Bessie. Okay? They're in Nazi concentration camps. Okay. Horrible things happen there. Corrie Ken Boone lost most of her family in the concentration camps. But beautiful things came out of that. Okay? Many people came to know the Lord in those concentration camps. Many people came to give up their rights to their life, their rights to be offended, their rights to hate their captors, and they embrace salvation. Very practical, simple, beautifying thing that came out of that. Years after the war was over, um, Corey Ten Boom was involved in taking over one of those concentration camps and making it a place of, of restoration and hope. They went through and they, they took all those buildings, those nasty buildings that were filled with vermin, lice, fleas, and they cleaned them all out and they painted them and they beautified them and they opened it up as a Christian restoration place. I, I mean, how much more demonstration do we need that God can take ugly and make them beautiful? See, God, being perfect in love, dwells in us, right? And one of the fruits of the Spirit is love. I'm not talking about that little sissy molly coddling love. Oh, baby, you're so cute when you break my base. No, it's, it's the love that says, baby, don't touch that. There are severe ramifications if you touch that. Okay? It's that love that cares enough to say, don't play in the street. It's dangerous. That's the love that we have living inside of us. And I ask you, do you love your neighbors? And I, I don't mean necessarily the people that are living right next door to you because your neighbors are anybody that you dwell with, that you interact with regularly. Okay? Do you love them enough to tell them to get out of the street? You see, sharing my heart, there are a lot of times, man, I, I, don't, I don't, man, you know what he'll say to me if I tell him that? They, they don't want to be my friend anymore. Would you rather lose a friend in this life and gain a brother or sister in eternity? Because see, the thing that draws us back most often is fear. Right? Now, are we honest? It's fear. What are they going to say? What are they going to do? <laughs> Talking with uh, your waitress in, in uh, well, Famous Dave's. Talking with your waitress in Famous Dave's. Are you willing to share with them what God has done for you? Or are you concerned, you know, your, your food might be delivered cold? Or just what they're going to say. Because see, here's the, here's the thing. This is the point I want to get to. Perfect love casts out fear. Okay? Now, we are being made perfect. You, you understand that. This is increasingly, not perfectly. Okay? You don't all of a sudden just overnight become Jesus. We work and we work and we work. We grow in maturity. See what he says here? Whoops. My page turned. never get beyond being a baby. <coughs> okay. If we are moving forward in God, we've got to mature. We've got to become better. We've got to become more. We've got to grow up. We've got to quit doing childish things. 
When I was a child, it was okay to act like a child. When I become a man, I put away childish things. Okay? So, are we willing to be a stench? Do we love them enough to be a stench? Are we willing to embrace the life that God has called us to, a life that is indicative of suffering, of having the world hate us, of, of having the world not be our friends? Because remember what we talked about last week. Friendship with the world is hatred toward God. It's making God your enemy. Are we willing to do that? Has God called you to be a hiney? Or has God called you to be integrated, to be motivated, to be involved in what's going on in the local body and outside. I have so many people that I, I meet that are Christians that, man, they got all kinds of energy. They got pep. They've got verse. Man, when it comes to doing stuff in the church, they're all on board. But, man, if you were to meet them in the supermarket, you'd never know that Christ was in their life. See, it can't just be this way. It's got to start here and go that way. It's got to go out. I want to challenge you. I want you to seriously consider why you don't invite friends to church. I don't, I'm not, at, this is not Float Glenn's vote day. I don't care if they come to this church. We love them. We would love to have them. We always look to expand our fellowship. But invite them to a church. A Bible-believing church that goes beyond just clever stories out of antiquity. Examine your heart. Why are you not inviting them? Okay, I'm not even asking. But I'm going to make it harder. How about asking ones that you know aren't Christians? come to church. Because, you know, when, when you know they're Christians, that's not too difficult. And, I mean, when you sit in your fellowship with someone, you say, oh, okay, well, hey, you know, we got something going on in church. But that's easy. I, I want to talk, you know, I don't want to steal sheep. I don't want to build our church by stealing sheep. <coughs> if I take five sheep from that church and three feet for sheep from that church, and we have here, we got eight more sheep, but the overall number of sheep hasn't grown. All we've done is shift them around. I want us to be invested in making goats sheep and bringing them in that way. See, that's what I want this body to be about. I don't want us to be an ingrown hair that festers and gets rotten and is nasty and painful. I want us to be outside of these walls. This is where we start. This is where we get revitalized. This is where we get energized. This is where we come together as a group and worship the Almighty God. You know you can worship God without any music at all? You, you, you know that, that singing the songs is not worshiping God? I, mean, I sing songs all the time with never a thought in my head about God. Sometimes, on a Sunday, I'll go through two or three songs, thinking about this or thinking about that, trying to remember what I was supposed to remember to tell people, or, you know, and all of a sudden I realize... And I haven't paid attention to anything that I've sung in the last two or three songs. And I've missed opportunity to worship God, to give Him what is rightfully His. So, you know, we come together corporately to worship God, to bless Him. See, this right here is part of worship. Because we're, we're, we're looking into His Word, the Word that He has given us, His beloved people. This is part of worship. You know, worship can be in complete silence. I'll tell you one of the best places for me to worship is sitting out on my swing in the evening when that cool breeze starts to come in and it bushes off the, the heat of the day. Man, I can sit there alone with God. I can look down the valley. I can see the beautiful things that he's created and given me opportunity to live in. But, you know, we don't all get that opportunity. He might call you to somewhere with sand flies. But his grace is sufficient, Right? But man, in those quiet moments, I can worship God. Are you willing to be who God has called you to be? Now, I'm not talking about this nonsense of, 
of, of, of these, these things that the, 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 some of these churches and these TV shows will tell you about. I'm talking about being at your base, Christ-like. And let other things flow out from that. I've heard so many people say, oh yeah, you know, I'm called to be an evangelist. And the only people I ever hear you tell Jesus about is me. Tell them. Oh, I'm a prophet. Well, the fact that you had to tell me that indicates you're not. Look, work on the foundations first. Let God build from the foundations what he will. What kind of plant God wants. Does God want a chrysanthemum? Are you going to write because you want it to be a rose? Are you willing to let God do as he will? See, this is the nature of what Paul is telling us. Filling up in his body the suffering. When one part of the body hurts, the entire body hurts. Okay? If you're hurting and the body doesn't know it, why do you suppose that is? If you're hurting and I'm not hurting, why do you suppose it is? Well, one of two things. Either I am incredibly self-centered and selfish, or you didn't tell me. Judah has his own opinion as to which it is. <laughs> Are we willing to be invested? Are we willing to do to be a stench? Are we willing to take what we believe and profess in here and do it out there? Because if we're not, I believe our proclamation of Him as Lord is a lie. It's a lie. Okay? If the life you lead here is a double life because it's different markedly than the life you live out there, then I have to question salvation because God has made in us a new creature. We are not bipolar. We're not, we're not created to be bipolar. We're not created to come in here and act one way and go out there and act another. Amen? Okay? Do you understand the grace that he's given you? The marvelous, fantastic, incredible, awesome grace that he's given you? Don't you want them to have that too? Don't you want the fullness of what he has for you? Don't you want to grow into maturity? To be more tomorrow than you were today? To be more next year than you were last year? Are you a hiney in the body of Christ? I don't know about you guys, but I want to be a stench. Now look, this whole body of Christ thing means you don't have to do it alone. You don't have to go it alone. It's not you against them. Okay? Because the battle's already won. There is no battle anymore. You know? They're already defeated. The enemy they serve is already defeated. So I would encourage you, examine your heart. Are you a stench? Are you willing to be a stench? If you're not willing to be a stench, are you willing to be made willing? I've had to ask God that sometimes. When he wants me to do something, God, I don't want to do that. Help me to be willing to do that. Make me willing to be willing. I, I don't want to do that. Don't talk to that person. That person's mean, God. They got a foul mouth, and they say things that are most unpleasant. Have you smelled that person's breath? And they always stand like, right here. <laughs> God, make me willing. Give me a heart that is willing. Amen? Let's be stinky for God. Right? Before the world, we have to stink. 